Welcome to Gray County Life at Home. I'm one of your hosts, Rhonda Brown, with the always delightful Charlie. And we have Mary Jane Murray. Good morning, Mary Jane. How are you today? Oh, good morning, Rhonda. And it's good to see you. Uh, this is the first time that we've uh, been able to spend any time together. And it's wonderful to do that. And with Charlie Brown being so black, the only time I can see, really see him is when he licks his tongue and that little pink tongue sticks <laughs> out and it's always a pleasure to have Charlie with us. Thank you. Yeah, he's, uh, you know, he is a good companion and, and I, well, I'll just lead into it. Uh, our very good friend and producer Darlene Van Witt here at Rogers, a good friend and confidant of mine, um, as I'm sure Anybody who's a fan of the show is aware at this point that she did pass away. And, you know, she is a great lover of animals. And uh, she always she does inspire me. Uh, you know, we've uh, always talked about how when the, her and Paul and the kids moved into their new home, that she was going to get some baby goats. And, yeah, we have just, you know, the sense of humor there, the friendship, as I say, uh, is dearly, dearly missed and i just yeah just our condolences to the family and, and i know mary jane you have uh something that you would like to say as well that from all of us well yes i do but i i do want to mention just before uh i get started and that is um their their dog uh lily i think they had uh eight puppies yeah. and <laughs> So um, uh, unfortunately, one of them passed away, but there's the, this little dog produced eight, eight puppies and seven have survived. So now they have quite a menagerie of animals um, at their home that they're having to, uh, to deal with and, and lots of love uh, because they, they certainly love their animals. And as, as you mentioned, Darlene always, I always love the, the dogs yeah. and the cats. Yeah. And you know what? That you know what? You remind me of the fact that Charlie Brown came into my life and my family's life. It was in 2015, and it was after we did lose uh Papa Brown and Grandpa Jerry, both my my stepdad and my father-in-law, uh, both within a week of each other. And it was at that time that I said to my husband of the time that, you know, I think maybe it's time that we got that puppy that we've talked about for a while. And that's how Charlie came into our life. And I'm glad that their dog had her puppies when she did, because it is, it's just something to focus on. And, you know, grief is a, a challenging thing at the best of times and during this time of covid and two years of this just nasty business i think our our level to uh, experience and deal with tragedy and grief is that much more challenging so you know you do have to have moments of joy too and that's what little dogs and puppies and rabbits and birds and all of these things can do for us, which is a good thing. Oh, oh, it is. And so you can, you know, give Charlie a, a, a hug for me. Uh, we, we don't at the moment have <laughs> yes. any pets, but Renee keeps, you know, really trying with her <laughs> adorable adoptables. She's really trying. And I think that's her goal is for us to have a dog before um, we, we really sort of finish up at this at some point, but just getting, just getting back to Darlene, she, she was our dear friend and, and our producer. And I, I really wanted just to express that and it was such a difficult, <clears throat> a difficult week for us. And you and I had the opportunity to take the week off. And I really just wanted to thank our viewers for being patient because uh, we actually asked Mark to do uh, a previous show so that you and I would have time to process our, our grief. And, um, and so a, a previous show was run instead of our usual Happy New Year 
uh, program that we had planned. And so, you know, our viewers have been very kind uh, and with their kind words and with their, with their patience. But even though you and I had the opportunity to take some time off, Mark was still back at the station, producing programs, managing the station, all the while he was grieving for the loss of his colleague of 20 years. So um, Mark was still carrying on um, and uh, we appreciate that. Um, we also, um, on a more positive note, just wanted to mention that there's been an award that has been set up in the name of Darlene Van Wyck for students who of Gray County who are engaged in or um, I'm thinking of becoming engaged in or currently engaged in post-secondary school in media studies. Now that includes film, radio, broadcasting, photography, and television. So if anyone is interested in contributing to this fund, um, it's through, donations can be made through the Community Foundation of Gray Bruce, Bruce, of Gray Bruce. And you just need to make a note that indicates that it's the Darlene Van Wick Award. And um, we are so pleased that, that uh, Carol Merton and Ruth Lovell worked with uh, Stuart, Stuart Reed and, um, and Paul Van Wick in order to put this award program together and to Rogers TV for helping to contribute the funds to uh, support the award that would be the that is being initiated. Yeah, so, that's so special. And I know that that would just, I think, would tickle Darlene Pink. So I think that is a wonderful tribute. And with that, we will start our show. And we will be back after these messages with more Gray County Life at Home. Thanks for joining us. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. At St. John Ambulance, we're all about community. We teach life-saving skills and provide community support through our volunteer services. All St. John Ambulance product sales and training registrations support these important services. Volunteer, donate, or enroll in a program today so we can continue to have an impact on our community. Visit sja.ca to learn more. At St. John Ambulance, we do more than save lives. We change lives. The regulars, the guys who keep this place in business. Last week, they had something to celebrate. Jason had just finished university. So they toasted his profs, his TAs, his old roommates, well, they toasted just about everyone. But I worry about and take care of my guys. So even when I know they're not driving, sometimes that means bringing them a little surprise. And then they had a drink to me. Brought to you by SmartServe Ontario and Arrive Alive, Drive Sober. Join us next time on Gray County Life at Home as we're gonna be talking with the folks from the Fresh Roots Cafe. Gray County Life at Home. We have some special guests today from one of one of my favorite places because of my kids, St. Mary's High School here in Owen Sound. Mary Jane, do you want to introduce these lovely ladies? Well, yes, we have with us Lorelei Hay, and she is the RISE program facilitator at St. Mary's High School. And then we also have Aubrey Upshot, Urbshot, I'm sorry, and Ruth Duncan 
who are both students at uh, St. Mary's High School, that they have done a really incredible project. And I'm just gonna ask Lorelei to talk, uh, tell us a little bit more about what the RISE program is. Okay, so the RISE program is an initiative um, for the Bruce Gray Catholic District School Board. Um, it was designed to um, connect Indigenous ways of knowing and our own educational system to marry it, sort of, and to allow students to express themselves through the arts. I have the course outlined, so I'm going to just read to you what RISE stands for. Reconnecting identity and spirit through the environment, nurturing the student's well-being is the foundation of a successful educational experience. Um, and the motto is, I am seen, I am heard, and I am valuable. So basically, the course is integrating Indigenous culture and knowledge with um, our Ontario Catholic graduate expectations of being an effective communicator, a creative and holistic thinker, and a responsible lifelong learner. Well, that sounds amazing. I'm so, so pleased to hear the integration of uh, indigenous culture into the high school program. Mm -hmm. So with um, Lorelai, would you like to just introduce the project that Ruth and uh, Aubrey started? So we use the arts a lot um, in the program because, you know, sort of art is its own language and there's a way you can express yourself differently than just through writing. Um, we were lucky to have a partnership with Elephant Thoughts out of Collingwood. They provided um, equipment for the students to use and training. So basically the kids were allowed to just bring some of their, the things they were passionate about or the things that were on their mind or challenges that they were dealing with and then integrated into something that they could share and, you know, to be of service to our school community and our larger community, um, you know, and issues being an Indigenous youth as well. So this is the, the film was what they came up with. And so um, uh, Aubrey and Ruth, would you like to tell us about the film that you produced? <laughs> uh, Ruth, do you want to start or do you want me to start? Um, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think initially the um, inspiration came from a TikTok that Ruth and I had just been scrolling through one day. Um, and it was a TikTok that used the words, we are still here. And so I think we just kind of took that into our own hands and made it like um, in an Indigenous view. So we had started like um, rhyming off things that we have struggled in the past, um, just some things with racism or um, like the residential schools. And we just kind of took all of those and then put it together and ended up making our piece. We are still here. Um, so by turning that into our own version, um, we started thinking of some clips that we could use on our um, reserve to kind of make the whole piece come together. Um, so yeah, we used the equipment um, provided from Elephant Thoughts. Ruth and I traveled up to our reserve and just kind of shot a bunch of B-roll just so that when we put it all together, um, we could just find our favorite clips and it turned out to match perfectly. Ruth? Um, I think when we started the project, we both didn't really know where it was going or what was going to happen with it. And it just seemed like all the pieces kind of fell into place really well together. Um, and then from We Are Still Here, we decided that like that was such a good video and it was such an impactful video like in our school community and our like reserve community that we wanted to like continue to do more. So we decided to create a website with the help of the RISE program and Elephant Thoughts. And on that website, we have <clears throat> more videos and it's a place for indigenous youth to um, express themselves and their identity and kind of go off of our video that we made. 
And I think the reason that we created that website and still continue to make videos now is because of how we are still here impacted not only us, but like everyone around us. Like, I think we are still here serves as a reminder that indigenous people are still here, even after all the abuse and trauma and genocide and everything that we've went through. And I think our video just really hit on that point. And um, I just like how impactful two young girls can be to a whole community. Well, Rose, I think that was a really good segue into showing the film. And uh, so the film is uh, going to be integrated into our conversation. And perhaps now is a good time to put the film in. Kapeta Kotea, Hota, Hone, Meta, Kiata, Mena, Kenna, Skota, Nana, Hose, Mena, Hota, Hono, Ota, Mena, There was a time when we couldn't practice our songs or dances. I danced for those who couldn't. We are still here. There was a time when we couldn't practice our culture or use our sacred medicines. I smudge for those who couldn't. We are still here. There was a time when our language was taken from us. I'm learning my language for those who it was stripped from. We are still here. There was a time when we were forced to change our self-identities. I wear my moccasins and beads for those who were told they couldn't. We are still here. There was a time my hair was cut and forbidden. I braid my hair for those who lost theirs. We are still here. Still today, a girl was told she couldn't wear her ribbon skirt to a formal event at school. I wear my ribbon skirt on Wednesdays in solidarity with her. We are still here. There was a time in which all our lands were stolen. I honor and protect these lands we know are still ours. We are still here. Wow, that was an amazing video. I watched it myself as well. That is, uh, it is very inspiring. And the, as we were talking about earlier, Mary Jane was saying that the shots that you chose to use, the angles, the lighting, everything about it was really very beautiful. Very professional. <laughs> <laughs> So this film has taken on greater significance other than just your project. Tell us what happened with the film after you had completed it. So on October 21st, our film, We Are Still Here, was selected as a finalist and won top place in the documentary section at the Forest City Youth Film Festival at the Wolf Performance Hall in London. And that was a really exciting night for Aubrey and myself. Um, all our hard work from that video and other things we've been doing with our website and the project, it seemed to all pay off. And um, it just made us realize that like our video is very impactful and deserves to be shown all around Ontario, not just our school community. Um, so yeah, that was a really exciting night for us. Did you ever anticipate, because a lot of, uh, there were a lot of films that were submitted, did you ever anticipate that it would have the top honor in Ontario? 
No, I think Aubrey and I didn't even know about the film festival. And then um, someone who works at St. Mary's suggested that we submit it. So we, we did, not thinking anything of it. And then we found out we were finalists. And we were like, what the heck? That's so crazy. Like us, our video. <laughs> and then I remember when we were sitting in the performance hall, Aubrey and I were holding hands and we were like shaking and sweating. And it was after all these people got to see our video and then they announced that we won. And I, I think oh. we screamed. We were so excited. And yeah, <laughs> but we did not expect it. Well, and I, one of the things that impressed me so much about the video was the camera shots and how professional everything looked in terms of not only the dancing but the interludes with the water and the rocks and all of the other pieces that you put into it so who, how did you set up those camera shots um i oh sorry <laughs> no go ahead um, I would honestly say like that was our first video that Ruth and I had ever made. So I think we were quite surprised with how well our camera shots turned out. Um, but yeah, like I said, all of the filming just came from Ruth and I. We had three tripods that we had with us that day and we set them up in a circle, um, pressed record. And then Ruth and I kind of went in the circle, did our dance. I was playing powwow music outside of um, my truck on full blast so we kind of had like a beat to go to um and then at the end of it we kind of looked back at the cameras looking through the footage and we're like oh my gosh i don't think that footage could have turned out any better than what it did like the backdrop the lighting um the colors that ruth and i were wearing just kind of like stood out on all that white snow it was yeah we were surprised with ourselves how well it turned out and that specific day when we were filming, we, we were going to film in a different spot on our reserve and there was way too much snow. So we were kind of disappointed. We were like, we're not going to get this shot. So then we went out on a limb to go to our lighthouse and then it just ended up being the perfect shot of us dancing. And then also, I think with all the shots being on our reserve, it's like such a beautiful place. Nayashing being so beautiful that it couldn't not be a beautiful video that we produced. Yeah, it was a very good choice. Well, I think the the message also of uh, we are still here uh, has a, a very strong significance in terms of how it relates to the video so that you have integrated not only the message, but the cinematography as well and it has such a very strong professional look are you thinking you did mention that you're thinking of doing a part two of that of that video yeah so we have a website called nagani.com and we have a few other projects that we've made on that website but we think because of how impactful and inspiring we are still here was to so many people that it's about time for us to make a part two being as like it was our first video that we made um it was really good at the time but now that we've kind of produced more videos and kind of look back at we are still here i think we just have like so many more ideas that we think of that we could add to that to kind of top it um being as we have some experience now so I think if we did a part two, I think it would be just as, if not more impactful than our first, we are still here. So do you, see, oh. do you see yourselves going into film as a future prod, uh, career for the, for the two of you? Um, so Aubrey and I worked for Nawash Fisheries together this summer and that job like when you say fisheries assessment, it seems like it has nothing to do with filming, but we found a way to create videos while we were doing that job. And I think that filming together and creating content and making change is gonna be something that Aubrey and I continue to do for like as long as we're friends. Just even like as a side hobby too, like I'm still with fisheries right now and I'm kind of like the main photographer 
with the group. So I do like the interviews. We're working with CTRE right now to make a documentary in the future. And they want me to do like a lot of the filming around the reserve. I'm interviewing like fishermen and the people that work for fisheries and I really enjoy it. So that is amazing. Does I'm I'm wondering, does it spark dialogue between yourselves and fellow Indigenous students at St. Mary's as to what's possible out there and what they could accomplish if they put their minds to it? I think when We Are Still Here was first released once we finished the video, I think that um, it inspired a lot of our peers and I saw it inspire a lot of our peers um, because we that little video created so much change within our school community and other students within the RISE program saw that. And I think it just opened the gates for all of us youth to realize how powerful like our words are and how much change we can create. And I think it just like boost started the RISE program and um, really helped to inspire a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I have heard of another film it's called Resilience and they actually did a showing at uh, the Roxy Theater. Now I know that we're sort of still in um, a semi-isolation lockdown situation but this may be an opportunity to have things on a larger scale for our larger community, because it is so important that we learn more information about our Indigenous community and the history in our local area, particularly in, in Owen Sound. But um, I got the high sign from Rhonda to say that we're just mm -hmm. about out of time and to wrap it up. And I, just wanted to to thank Lorelai Hay for having this program integrated into the high school so that students can shine and bring out the very best of themselves and the information that can go out into the community. So very grateful for that, Lorelai. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you so much, Ruth and Aubrey, for coming on today to talk about your video. We look forward to seeing your future productions, and we'll be sure to put the website so that people can check it out online and see what you girls are up to and, and what's coming out of your, your inspired, inspired video. That is fantastic. Thanks so much. We'll be back after these messages on Great County Life at Home. I'm a singer-songwriter from Six Nations and I've been writing songs about my experience and with that being said it's helped me hold hope in my heart in following my dreams and being resilient to everyday indigenous battles. Competition between spirit, earth and wind, let me tell you now. This song in particular, The Shiner, is a special song that I wrote for my grandfather. He was a snow snake maker, and that is a Haudenosaunee winter sport. It's my job to educate and to share, and the music allows me to do that. He'll be shining snow snakes and mud cats to the end of his day. Every year, dozens of Canadians are killed or seriously injured because they take risks around railway tracks. Talk to your loved ones about rail safety. Visit StopTrackTragedies.ca. Hi, I'm Thomas Shade, a right wing with the Owens Attack. Go behind the scenes with your favorite team on Attack Rap every Tuesday on Rogers TV. County Life at Home. I'm one of your hosts, Rhonda Brown, with the completely passed out Charlie Brown and Miss Mary Jane Murray. And boy, the girls, 
Uh, Ruth and Aubrey, Mary Jane, very inspiring. I think that they are going to have some very bright futures here in our community as our Indigenous youth and uh, looking forward to seeing what they what they end up producing next. Oh, that will be very interesting. But once again, we're in a, the second segment and we do have some special guests with us today. And of course, they're from one of my um, favorite spots in Owen Sound, the YMCA of Grey Bruce. And, um, and we have Christine McCardle, who is the um, Community Justice Program and Restorative Justice, and along with Heather Taos, did I get it this time? <laughs> with Heather Taos, who is the Community Justice Program worker. And once again, uh, the YMCA is really an anchor in our, pro in our community that has so many um, programs that support the community on a lot of different levels. And this is um, new to me, the restorative justice. And um, so Christine, can you tell us more about the program and how it works? I sure can. Um, so the restorative justice program at the Y is technically not new. Um, in fact, we've been operating since 2001. <laughs> um, but we operate in a very limited setting. So um, it's often a program that unless you sort of had a, an opportunity to have contact with it, it might not be familiar to you. Um, so we enjoy having conversations like this where we can speak to people about what it is we do and how and why we do it. So um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. What, yeah, what does restorative justice, what, what is that? So restorative justice is um, a philosophy, if you will, a way of looking at things um, that differs somewhat from what we know as our traditional formal justice system. So in our traditional formal justice system, when a wrong happens, it's viewed as the breaking of a law. It's, it's the violation has happened against the state. If you look at things through a restorative justice lens, when wrong happens, it's viewed more as a trust that's broken and a violation against a person or their property or a relationship having taken place. So if I can put things in context in terms of our program a little bit. So within the justice world in Gray and Bruce, there are many facets, of course, and we operate technically as what's known as a diversion program. So diversion is um, an opportunity that's available to police and community and to Crown attorneys within our court system to, for reasons that they see as being beneficial, stream people away from the formal justice system. So, for example, for many young people, um, you know, their first brush with the law is very often the result of a bad choice or a not fully formed decision or the sense of a lack of options or a need. Um, very rarely is it a conscious, I'm going to break the law today <laughs> mindset or goal or plan. Um, now, does that make the offense any less illegal or any less negatively impactful to the people that involves? No, of course not. Um, but it does suggest that in certain situations, a response that differs from our formal justice system might be more beneficial. So when they're interacting with young people, police officers or Crown attorneys have the option under certain circumstances um, to divert them. And that's where the diversion programs enter into it. And that's part of what we do here at the Y with our, in our justice team. So a diversion program is, is meant to, I mean, we still need a response that holds a young person accountable for their behavior, that 
aims to prevent future offenses and that provides proportional and meaningful consequences for a young person's actions, right? So this means, so in a diversion program, we're, we're given a bit more leeway. We have a bit more of an opportunity to explore the circumstances of an offense. Um, and based on that information to create a more individual plan for a young person that's um gonna provide them with some education and some tools we hope that will allow them to make healthier more acceptable choices going forward right mm -hmm. so those tools can be things such as education around things like substance use or anger management or healthy communication skills things like that um my colleague heather will talk to you um in far more detail about that in a few minutes um they can also be more concrete things like resources to assist with housing or employment or education. And again, the fact that these programs are based at the Y, Mary Jane, is such a, a unique and lovely opportunity because it dovetails so well with other, other services available at the Y and, and it allows for um, those connections to be made uh, perhaps a bit more seamlessly than they would in other situations. So all of those are really useful tools and we make really good use of them at the Y. Um, but what's determined to have to be a particularly valuable preventative tool, especially with young people, um, is the opportunity to gain an understanding of your, of the impact of your action on others. So to, to have a, to get a big picture, right, of, of who's been impacted by harm that's resulted from an offense by your actions and, and to understand that and, and to be able to engage with those people and explore how that wrong perhaps could be righted. So when we take an explorative, a restorative justice approach to youth justice, that's what we're allowing for. So in effect, we, we, we provide opportunities for people and communities to come together to resolve offenses, to resolve incidents, to repair harm. So in a nutshell, what we do is we hold um, what we refer to as justice circles, and they are opportunities for young people, their families, their communities, and their victims, should they wish to participate, an opportunity to come together and deal with a specific issue, a specific offense. So a justice circle is, is a one-time meeting. Um, there's a lot of preparation going into it and there's a lot of work done by the young person after it, but the circle itself is a one-time meeting. It's a facilitated process and our facilitators are all very well-trained community volunteers. Um, and basically what we do is we provide a forum and a little bit of guidance in assisting people in um, telling their stories, for want of a better phrase, um, sharing really specific information about how they've been impacted by what's happened. Um, it provides a, an opportunity for them to have that voice, for those who have been harmed to have that voice. It also provides an opportunity for young people to be in in the greatest sense of the word, personally responsible for their actions because they are sitting with people that they have wronged. Um, and, and once everyone's had an opportunity to tell their story and all of that information is out on the table, then we spend some time creating a, a plan for restitution, what we refer to as an agreement. Um, sometimes those agreements contain really concrete things like financial restitution, um, replacement or repair of stolen property, uh, replacement or repair of damaged property. Sometimes people will say, I, I really just want to see you learn something from this, right? So we explore ways, okay, how can the young person demonstrate that to you? Um, sometimes a genuine apology is really all that people need to feel that they can move forward comfortably. 
the goal of our process is to is to as much as we can um, take people to a place where they can at the conclusion of the process feel that the situation is resolved that they can move forward in a positive way and put this behind them and that's you know provides as much benefit for the young person as it does for the victim right so in a nutshell that's what we do wow um this is a, a very unique uh, situation instead of going to the criminal courts. So Heather, I just wanted to to draw you into the conversation and and to talk about um, you know some of the outcomes that you feel are happening in terms of how this program impacts on the community itself. Yeah, so my role actually within um, our community justice program is I get to facilitate those workshops and I get to facilitate the workbooks and the workbook review sessions. So I actually really get firsthand, um, yeah, I guess firsthand um, with the clients along with the youth. And yeah, so far I have received really positive feedback, um, especially from the youth themselves. Like. I always end off my workshops by asking them, okay, what's one thing that you've learned today? And what's one thing that we're gonna make sure we don't do in the future? And it's always, I'm not gonna do this again. And that is by far, I always like to say my best response that I can receive. Do you feel that by diverting some of the, say minor wrongs that are happening, that it's actually uh, reducing the pressure on the court system? Yes, so definitely. That is absolutely, I think, one of the major impacts is right now with the court system. It is relieving some of the pressure that they have been receiving <laughs> lately, especially um, I know that there was quite a big backlog. So now with the diversion program and people being diverted instead of um, going to court and the whole process dragging on for months. Yeah, no, the diversion is quick, it's fast, it's effective, and so far it's helping the courts quite a bit. Do you feel that, or do you know whether or not um, the charges uh, go to a criminal record or if they go through the diversion program, they have avoid a criminal record? Yeah. So Sorry, Christine, go ahead. Well, that's okay. So if a young person completes diversion successfully, no matter how they come to us, so uh, we accept referrals, as we said earlier, from both police and courts, so pre-charge and post-charge, if you will. Um, and in the case of a pre-charge referral, which would come to us from a police service, from a police officer, um, upon completion, of our program successfully report goes back to police. I mean, I, I will be clear, we're obligated to report back either to police or courts um, pretty specifically about what what's happened, what this young person has done, how they've participated in the program. It's by no means a, a get out of jail free card. Um, in fact, it's sometimes a harder process for a young person to go through diversion than it is for them to participate in the more formal court process. Um, but upon completion of diversion successfully, um, there is no criminal record. So um, police who refer a young person, they do that instead of laying a formal charge. They have the option, they maintain the option to lay a formal charge if the young person isn't successful. But if the young person is successful, then that file is simply closed when the police officer receives the report back. Mm -hmm. And similarly, in the court process, if a young person is referred for diversion during your youth court, then that matter is adjourned to allow them time to complete the program. And upon completion, that charge is withdrawn. So, I mean, one of the most concrete benefits of diversion for a young person is the opportunity to come away from this experience in a way that is not going to hamper um, or hinder choices that they may want to make in the future, um, as we all know having a criminal record can do. So that's certainly a very concrete benefit of diversion. 
but there's there's lots of lovely little benefits that come from diversion and the restorative justice portion of it in particular. I mean, we've had young people who have been tasked with providing personal service for a victim, for example, and the victim has been so impressed with their their work and their work at their, that they've been offered employment. Um, so it's a way of developing relationships within the community um, and strengthening them and creating them, um, not just necessarily repairing them. Wow. Well, Heather, what age range are you working with here? We, we, we use the word youth, but what is the age range? Yeah, so for our youth, it's any youth um, between the ages of 12 to 17. However, I also with the YMCA deal with adults as well. So really anyone from 12 and up. Oh, I see. So I, I know in, in different um, organizations, youth means something different in terms of age. And um, so basically, if you're looking at 12 to 17 year olds, you can really change the trajectory of their path going forward if they go through this program at an earlier age between 12 and 17. Yeah, so that would be under the Youth Criminal Justice Act and absolutely the youth um, under the Youth Criminal Justice Act, youth are held accountable differently than adults because we know that youth are going to, as Christine mentioned before, commit crimes that maybe didn't exactly understand that they were breaking the law or um, it could just be attention or anything, right? Many, many, many different reasons. But yes, youth, we do hold accountable a little bit differently than adults. Certainly we'll get to the point again where none of us getting any younger. We will get to the point where we'll need to be recruiting folks again, no doubt. Um, and typically there are folks who simply have an interest in um, young people or folks who have an interest in safe, healthy communities um, and, and are looking for ways to engage in opportunities that support that. Um, there's certainly training for our volunteers um, available. It's, a, it's, a, it's an informal process, as I've said, but it's, it's one based in science and theory, and we want people to understand that as they're facilitating. Um, so there's training in that regard as well. Um, and yeah, when we're next ready to recruit, we will absolutely be making the public well aware of that. It's, it's um, I think it's a, a testament to the program that the volunteers that we have have been so committed for so for such a great length of time. It certainly does. Well, I, I think that we are most definitely. What kind of show do you want to see on Rogers TV? What interests you? Log on to rogerstv.com, fill out a show proposal, and tell us about your segment idea. We want to know what you want to see. Rogers TV, only on Rogers. I'm Nicole Martin, the proud ambassador for the Comfort Bear program. Comfort Bears provide these cuddly bears to local children who are terminally ill, facing trauma, or battling a serious illness. Every $20 donation will place a Comfort Bear into the loving arms of a child involved in our program. It is our hope to distribute 1,000 bears in 2022. Please join us and provide comfort to kids in their time of need. When an impaired driver killed my brother DJ, my life changed forever. Life has changed for all of us during the pandemic, and many people are turning to alcohol and drugs to cope. Even though most of us are staying home more, police across Ontario are seeing an alarming increase in impaired driving and the horrible devastation that goes with it. Now, more than ever, we need your commitment to never drive impaired and to encourage all of your family and friends to do the same. Together, we can save lives. Are you the type who would keep going or stop? It's not easy to stop when you have an addiction. Legalizing cannabis won't stop addiction. It trivializes its consumption. Let's be vigilant. If you need help, visit portage.ca. Well, welcome back to Great County Life at Home. And as you may have noticed, 
we don't have any adorable adoptables with us. We still have Heather and Christine. And it turns out that our adorable adoptables is not available today. So Heather and Christine have agreed to stay and answer some of the questions that Mary Jane and I actually both came up with during the earlier segment. So uh, what we were talking about is the idea of when a crime seems victimless, as Christine put it uh, so succinctly. Uh, what happens when there isn't an actual private citizen who is the victim of a crime? And Christine, do you want to uh, share that with us again so that everybody can hear, hear your words of wisdom here? <laughs> well, that's very generous of you, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, as we all know, in the grand scheme of things, there are no victimless crimes, particularly when we're talking about situations that young people are involved in. Um, if you consider a victim to be anyone who's been impacted by a crime, and again, speci speaking specifically about young people, um, their parents have most definitely been impacted by what's happened, um, and having the ability to have that conversation with parents and young people is often a bit of an eye opener. Um, certainly when our kids do wrong, um, you know, we, we have that conversation. We know that they've done wrong and we, we ensure that they know that they've done wrong, but we don't often share things like, gosh, that really scared me, or I was so worried for you, or that doesn't make me feel like I did a really good job. Um, those are ways in which parents are impacted. That two in the morning call from a police officer is terrifying. Um, those aren't the type of things we tend to talk about when we're disciplining our kids. So that aspect of the conversation is often really valuable. There are certainly times when public property is damaged. Um, you know, damage to something in a park or a conservation area or graffiti in our communities, vandalism. Um, oftentimes, property is owned by people and, and, and they're prepared to come and participate, but oftentimes it is public property, um, in which case municipalities are sometimes invited to the process, chambers of commerce, downtown improvement associations, horticultural associations, if it's been public gardens damaged, things like that. So, you have to, I mean, we encourage the kids to look at the big picture. Um, and when we're looking at who's impacted by incidents um, as facilitators, we have to look at that big picture too and realize that the ripple effect travels through our communities and, and allow those opportunities into the circle as well. Absolutely. I think that one of the, the things that uh, is important um, particularly uh, when I, um, when my middle son was in his teenage years and always liked to walk that really fine line of risk taking and um, liked to hang out with the group that always got into trouble, but he himself never actually did it. It's really comforting for a parent to know that these are some options and can actually sit down and have conversations with their, with their children around um, this is what happens when you do this in a community like graffiti, um, or in my youth, it was always a brick through the, the school uh, window, um, to actually talk to your children about what are the options in the community. This leads you into a criminal path. This leads you to an, a, another option. And I think that if parents are aware of this program, and how it can impact how they speak to their children um, or their teenagers around what are the consequences. This was a big thing in my family. How do you make restitution? You are responsible and you have to pay for your actions. So um, Heather, when you're uh, conducting your workshops, uh, the, the restorative, uh, um, circles. One, I think, one of the criteria is that um, they have to actually express remorse and accept responsibility and then develop that meaningful plan. So what happens if 
they're not terribly remorseful. <laughs> you know what? It has happened. Um, there's some, sometimes, I mean, things happen and we don't exactly think we're in the wrong, right? And that's just sometimes that black and white thinking, right? Um, however, when that happens and we don't take responsibility for our actions, um, it, it kind of comes down to me, right? And I get to determine whether or not you are successful with the program or if I think you may need some more resources. Um, so for example, I run a couple workshops where I didn't think it was exactly that impactful. And I've asked the um, direct accountability program coordinator to add on some extra workbooks to do with me and to maybe do some community service hours as well, just to make sure that, you know what, they, they are officially owning up to their actions and realizing that I need to take responsibility. If so, yeah, we will. Yeah, if they go into the program not really feeling uh, remorseful, do you does it actually change their mind as they go through the process? Most of the time, yes. I would like to think so, but um, Christine, if you would like to touch on that, you can too. I No, I think you're covering everything off beautifully, Heather. Um, I mean, certainly the act of hearing, I mean, specifically in terms we're, we're, we're sort of talking apples and apples to salad here um, with the workshops and the restorative justice program. One certainly flows to the other, but I mean, certainly within the circle process, um, the act of listening to another person's story about how they've been impacted is really powerful. And so, um, and I know we don't have a lot of time and you're right, this is worth another conversation for sure. But in the circle process, it's the young person who speaks first, um, who tells their story first. And there's lots of reasons for that, that we can go into when we speak again. But at the end of their storytelling time, they're asked, is there anything you'd like to say before we move on? Um, and often they say, sorry. And you say, Okay, and and then and and then is the opportunity for the victim to tell their story. And in most circumstances, that's all new information to the young person, and it's usually very personal and it's usually very impactful. These can be very emotional settings. Um, so, victim has an opportunity to tell to tell their story. Um, if victim has any support with them, they're offered an opportunity to speak. Parents are offered an opportunity to speak. And before we move on to talking about the agreement, the plan for restitution, we'll say to the young person, is there anything you want to say before we move on? And often it's sorry again, but it's, it's a very different sorry because it comes with a much greater understanding. The original apology is based on here's here's what I did to you and here's my understanding of what that means, right? Wow. Well, Christine, we have to have you ladies back to talk more about this. It's a very interesting topic. And Call the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. Your mouth can do a lot of amazing things. 